Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Capital One Bank, Sterling National Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, B6 Real Estate Advisors, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, RPW Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Maringor Family Foundation, and these friends. My crystal apple over there. How do we see 2019? Is it going to be a good year? How do bankers look at the year? How do they see the opportunities in banking for 2019? So today I've assembled three bankers to provide their insight on the thoughts for 2019. My guests include Matt Petrillo, Senior Group Manager, Commercial Real Estate Financing with m and Bank. David Bagatelle, President of the New York City Metro Market and Executive Vice President, Sterling National Bank. And last but not least, Chris Niedeprune, who is the Managing Director of Real Estate Finance for CIT. So, David, you're, you're the guy on both sides of the coin. <laughs> you know real estate, you know middle market. How does the bank and how do you see 2019? Because, you know, if you look at the stock market for 2018, up and, up and down, up and down, up and down, tariff discussions, other discussions, how does the bank look at the, are there great opportunities or where do you see the market? Sure, so, so barring any sort of macro shocks to the market, anything sort of globally or anything domestic that's, uh, that's kind of outside of our control, um, I, I would say right now we're being pretty cautious. We're keeping our eye on the credit markets, um, keeping our eye on the economy, obviously interest rates, um, as we've seen, have gone up a little bit. Um, Will rem remains to be seen what will happen in 2019 based on uh, Chairman Powell's comments uh, last week at the Economics Club. So we're, um, we're being cautious. Uh, with that being said, um, we are uh, certainly out there still active, uh, lending money, uh, bringing in new depository clients, um, uh, still looking to, to hire teams. And, um, you know, we're definitely open for, open for business. How do you look at the new, the world of tech? Because tech has had such a major effect on all, all areas. How do you look at it when you're financing commercial real estate, when you're financing a tech company in, in general? Because, you know, many of these tech companies are startups and they don't have profitability right now. How do you, how do you look at it, Chris? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I think, you know, all tech is not created equal, right? And I think in the, cycle, the prior tech cycle, a lot of the firms were just funded by venture capital, but so many of them are profitable now. Um, there's kind of two, two worlds of, of tech. I, I actually, I, he I heard a new term recently, FANG, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. So if you have that elk and Apple, someone like that, very different than you know, a startup who's still in their 
in their uh, fundraising. And I've done a number of shows recently on real estate technology. Okay, I've seen these companies who come here who right now are doing um, AI and they're also certain companies doing office leasing by technology and they're not profitable. And when I say to them, you know, you aren't profitable, how could you want a bank to lend you money? They said, you know, Amazon was, was not profitable for years. So I listened to that, but as a, as a banker who, you know, who has to report to uh, shareholders, all three of you are bankers working for entities over there, how do you look at this when somebody says to you, you know, trust me, and I'm not saying it in that way. Look, there's, there's a lot of sources of capital out there in the marketplace, right? So at a certain point, these companies are bankable credits. Um, until then, we're not a venture capital firm. We're not a traditional, a traditional startup uh, lender. There have been exceptions where existing clients get into different businesses or it's a new subsidiary where we'll finance that. Um, but typically, we're going to be sort of that second, third stage. We're going to come in after they've been financed by the VC, after they've um, at least approached profitability, uh, proved viability of whatever the concept is. Um, the one thing, though, is, I mean, New York has become um, a hotbed for tech. There's no doubt about it. And it's an important part of the economy here. And it's something that, um, you know, we want to play a, a big part in going forward. How do you see M&T's position on the world of tech? Sure, so from the real estate perspective, um, which is obviously, you know, from, from my, my perspective, um, you know, we're always focused on concentration within our, our assets, within our buildings. How much income is derived from a certain tenant, whether that be uh, a new startup or, or, uh, or even an established company, you know, how, many, how, how much uh, exposure do we have to that, to that company, looking at financials for the tenants where, where possible. That's not to say, now, you know, the, the, the good news is I also have a buffer. I'm not lending to those companies directly. We do have uh, lines of business that do that. Uh, but in my case, I'm, I'm working with a seasoned developer who I know, generally speaking, know very well, who, you know, if, if it's important to that customer to, to finance an asset that might have a concentration that might be outside of our, out of our com comfort zone, well, maybe there's credit enhancement I can get in the form of an LC or some other type of, of guarantee. Um, and we're always underwriting to make certain that we could replace those rents uh, with, uh, in a fallback position. So here's a question for all three. You know, there's a millennium, okay, who's now 30 years of age. They work for a private equity firm or they work for a developer or they were in a different business and they want to go out on their own. How do you make a decision on who's going to be that next Blackstone or who's going to be that next successful developer? or the next uh, profitable small law firm. How do you rationalize when you go to credit committee that you should do a loan for somebody who doesn't have experience, Chris? I mean, speaking for us, that's, that's very difficult, right? I mean, we're, we're, to David's point, I mean, we're, we're more likely to, to finance uh, folks that have done it before, right? We're not generally, as banks, I don't think, bankers, right? We're not the, the entrepreneurial lender, right? That we're not the first source of capital, first time source of capital. Um, very difficult to sit in front of a, a, a bank credit committee um, and make that case uh, to do that. What we've done successfully in a few cases is make introductions between, you know, some young promising, uh, you know, but, but less experienced developer um, with, with a long-standing customer of ours who uh, might have capital to, to invest, who will, will take some, some type of control within that partnership and made a connection there and actually financed deals for them. But as you said, uh, on a standalone, it's going to be a very difficult story and, to, to sell. And, and Matt, I mean, it, in, in the real estate, in the commercial real estate space, so many of the partnerships today are, are, right. are built that way. Exactly. Right? They're, they're, yeah. they're a joint venture of institutional limited partner equity and a local you know, right. operator who maybe isn't as bankable on their own, right. um, but bringing that you know, large institutional uh, deep-pocketed investor to the table is helpful. Adding credit enhancement right. to the right. transaction, sure. Dave? So, I mean, we've seen a similar kind of thing where, whether it's on real estate or in the middle market space, where uh, people maybe have a little bit less experience, they'll partner with somebody who has a little bit more experience, or they'll be uh, sort of a, a godfather behind that person who is sort of, uh, sort of supporting that person. You know, it all comes down to people at yeah, the end of the day. Yeah, so. I, have a, I have an interesting topic. I failed to mention in the green room, but 
I was reading the paper today and looking at something, and it's something that all three of you have been involved with in, in different aspects. EB-5, okay? EB-5 was the major player. I remember a number of years ago, you guys went into Jersey City where you were paid off on the EB-5 mm. money without a problem. That's right. You've been involved with EB-5, and you've been involved in a different way with EB-5s, okay? You know, what's going to happen today? You know, the number of people are down. The wheel project is definitely having a major question on if these people can even get their visas and so on. You know, it was the flavor of the week, the EB-5. How do you look today if somebody came to you and said, I'm going to get financing from EB-5, and you as a and you you looked at the EB fives in a different collateral basis. Yeah, so we just we just closed on an EB five uh, bridge loan last week um, to close a uh, to close a particular deal. We're not only acting as a depository, but we are doing uh, bridge financing uh, to some of those uh, projects so that we can get they can get started earlier. I think what you're going to see there's going to be change in the program, no doubt about that. As we move into 2019. We've sort of kicked the can down the road, but that's gonna, there's definitely going to be a change in the program. Um, I think you'll see some of the marginal players in the space will sort of go, go away. Um, but the ones that the, hopefully the providers that we deal with who are the, mo who are the best in the, in the, in the now, industry the, will the, stick the around. Irony, the irony, the, the, the developer on the, the wheel happens to be one of the best developers around. It was just a problem with the question of how the financing got structured at the well, end. Well, it also, I'm not going to comment on that project, but it also <clears> comes <throat> down to the project also, right? So you still have to look ultimately at what the project is. You know, it can have, the, you know, it could be the best EB-5 uh, backers in the world, but if the project isn't a sound project. The other thing I will say about that is you're going to see a shift, I think, in the countries that are, um, that are providing the investors to EB-5. Historically, it's been sort of China. Um, you're starting to see a shift already to other countries, whether it be Brazil, India, uh, some of the African countries. So also I think a large number of French. How, how do you think you're going to see? Yeah, I mean, to your earlier point, Michael, the, you know, the EB-5 was the flavor of the day for, for some time. We've candidly seen very little requests for it lately. Um, I think there's so much other capital out there um, that is just as competitively priced um, that we, we've seen very little of the EB-5 these days. In a similar manner to the EB-5 is this discussion about the opportunity zones. It's from long-term capital gains, and it's in either an operating business or money being expensed into certain things. Have, have you focused on any thoughts on the opportunity zone? You know, we haven't yet. I, mean, I think it's very early days. We haven't seen much, much come out of that yet. There's been a lot of press. Um, different different points of view. Um, you know, I think it's a little early to. to no, I, I agree with you. Yeah. I just want yeah. any any. Yeah, you know, from what I've heard so far, and we're still in sort of in that same same learning mode. Um, it's um, it's a nice sweetener. Um, the customers we've I've spoken to have said that it's not likely to induce them into a project that they would not have otherwise done. There, it, it, you are on some level threading a needle. It's, it's rolling forward gains from another project. You're, the, really, the benefits are holding a, the, the, the replacement right, the long term, for, the long -term. for 10 years or more. Right, Otherwise, so you can omit the right. capital gains, correct. And it, and it has to be a development, too. It has to be either. Or an operating business. Oh, right, sorry, in the real estate space. That's exactly right. No, it's really, and, and I think it really was designed more around the, uh, to your point, around a business venture outside of real estate. David? Yeah, I mean, we have clients that are looking at the opportunities. We've looked at a couple of them. Um, I think people are a little nervous about some of the job creation elements of that because you are making a commitment. You are putting yourself out there and putting yourself somewhat at risk. But just like with EB-5 or anything else, it, it does come down to the project onto itself. The project has to make sense. I think people aren't going to necessarily just do those deals because they're in an empowerment zone onto itself. I think it's, it's, an, it's a nice benefit on top of uh, already what somebody's going to do. Another topic of major discussion in 2018 was the Amazon effect and the technology effect, as you, as you mentioned, on New York City. What do you see effect with regard to how you're going to lend and how your, your committees will look at this type of wonderful effect on the city? First of all, I think it's great for the city. I think the continuing that sort of di diversification of our workforce um, in New York is, is, a, is a smart thing and that it, sh that it should continue. 
Um, does it change so much? We're excited about it. We're, we'll continue to look at projects uh, that are important to our customers. Um, and you know, I, it is nice to see um, even more demand now in Long Island City, where, which is a market that we're seeing a lot of supply. Right, but uh, you know, this is not only going to be Long Island City because if you have the twenty-five thousand jobs, you, you have people coming over here, and certain of those people. And I, I was with John Castamatidis of the Red Apple Group, and uh, he, he basically said, "You yeah, look." Some of these people are going to be moving to Coney Island. Some of these people are going to be moving to outskirts in other parts of the borough. You can't underestimate the impact of 25,000 direct jobs. Not direct jobs. Direct jobs. That's not correct. Well, the influence of it, it's going to be felt all throughout the area, to your point. I mean, even in, in Newark, where Audible already is, which is an Amazon company, they, they lost out, but they really didn't lose out because Amazon's going to be in the area. They're going to get more jobs there as well. I mean, we were... There were a couple deals we were looking at in Long Island City that were sort of off the table that are <laughs> suddenly back on the table um, with, right. with uh, them moving in. There, and by the way, of course, there is more of an impact on the overall city, but there is a big impact on Long Island City and sort of that, that area as well. I mean, in, in a similar manner, and you're recently doing a deal with the Cornell Tech, the health sciences over there, has only enhanced... Long Island City, Queens, and the Upper East Side of Manhattan. You're financing a, a great project on 61st Street. I mean, if you look at if you look at the Upper East Side, uh, where you're referring to, where the the, the hospitals are uh, in the 60 Bed Pen Row. Bed Pen Row, as you as you earlier referred to it. I mean, it's it's one of the the, the better office markets, uh, you know, probably in, in the country, but in New York, right? I mean, that's there's, it's. You do a construction uh, project up there, it's almost built to suit without a tenant. Right. I think we're in the midst, really, if you look at what's gone on on Roosevelt Island, Hudson Yards, Amazon coming in, we're in the middle of a real, um, maybe even the tail end of a huge transformation of New York City from Wall Street, right? The Wall Street was the economy in New York at one point, certainly when I started my career, to now it becoming really um, uh, very tech-centric and very diversified. And I think the overall, um, the overall impact in the New York economy has been um, uh, tremendous, really, really great when you see the whole, the whole shift away from Wall Street. Who would have thought that Wall Street would sort of not be the dominant employer and New York would even be better? Than, right. Than Wall Street today is the, te is the stepchild as opposed to the, to the positive over there. How, how do you see these, this, the suburbs? I know most of you are spending most of your time within the New York area. Mm -hmm. But you know, when, you, when you're talking about the community, there's the New Jersey market, there's the Westchester market, okay? Which has changed, in, uh, in, you know, even with regard to their fang or their other situation. Have you uh, done much? We haven't done much in the suburban markets, either you know, New Jersey or Westchester, but I, I would agree with you, it's, you know, it's, it's changing. Um, I don't know if it's fully changed, but it's changing. The view of no one, no one moved to the suburbs is changing, right? Millennials are, are, are getting married, they're having families, they're buying homes, they're moving to the suburbs, so that's happening. Um, the suburban office campuses that were um, you know, effectively you know, dead 10 or 15 years ago have seen some revitalization, not all of them. There right, are and, and many of them are seeing the, a different type of revitalization. Right. They're, being, they're, being cut, they're being destroyed and being rebuilt as residential complexes. Right. You know. We've done quite a bit of, of multifamily uh, rental uh, out on Long Island, um, some in New Jersey as well, uh, transit-oriented. Uh, you know, there's such a shortage of rental, quality rental housing in the suburb, you know, in the uh, in the metro suburbs. It, it seems uh, that uh, it's been uh, it's been a big business for us recently. How do you see the transit-oriented developments in Westchester, in New Jersey? I mean, you even yourself, David, you're living in Fort Lee. You know, the convenience to the city. You know, we're, we're very active in that space. I mean, the people that, um, that live in, well, that work here have to live somewhere. Not everybody's going to live in Manhattan. Um, so there are, and, and people want to have families, and they don't necessarily want to raise a family in an urban environment. So, um, you know, we're very bullish on those transit-oriented uh, projects. Uh, the one concern that, that I'll sort of surface is the, the overall infrastructure in New York. I mean, you saw what happened. You know, we had a, a minor snowstorm uh, at rush hour when it wasn't predicted, and it ground the city to a screeching mm -hmm. halt. And, uh, you know, people taking three and a half hours to drive, you know, 10 miles out of the city. So something's got to be done in the New York uh, area about the, about the infrastructure. It's, you know, it's terrible. How do you, as bankers, 
look at the hospitality market as lenders in, in general. So uh, hospitality is a big business for us uh, at M&T. You know, we choose those just with, as with any other asset class. We choose those, those spots uh, very carefully, and they're typically for, especially development, uh, is going to be for an existing, long-standing existing customer. And, you know, the book, uh, we, we're expecting to see um, a decline in, in ADRs and occupancy. And in 2018, it's actually been pretty strong. Um, so, so that's uh, being the, the amount of supply that's been added. David, what do you... So, I mean, we're marginally active in the space. Like anything else, we like to align ourselves with the right sorts of clients. And, um, and we think we, we have. Um, we're not actively going out and looking for necessarily new uh, clients in the space, but the ones we have we're happy with and uh, you know the assets are all performing and um, you know I, I would say like anything else we're a little bit cautious uh, in terms of particularly Manhattan uh, the, 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 the overbuilt potential for being overbuilt here in the city. Chris? Yeah, I, I echo David, we're marginally active in the hotel space, um, cautious, uh, focus primarily on you know who the sponsor, who the client is. Um, hotel lending is a tough business in general. You know, we, when we're talking about the Fang world, okay, the Amazons, the Jets, uh, you, you know, the, the Target shipment, the Instacart, all of these companies over there, uh, there's a dire need for industrial. Would you would you entertain that type of deal? Industrial is the you know people say it's the it's the darling of real estate these days, right? I mean, <laughs> and no matter how much is built it gets it seemingly gets leased if you look at the projections for 2019 um, continue to supply to deliver more more product and it will continue to absorb um, we've you know folks are doing speculative development and it's it's leasing very quickly so. Dave we like the asset class the problem is the pricing you know can you uh, can you make money off of it as a as a financial institution and uh, it's really it's really hard right now Matt yeah, same here. Uh, as far as a stabilized deal, it's very tough to, to price. Institution, they're uh, typically going to, uh, to life companies and, and uh, sources of, of very cheap capital. Uh, we've done a few uh, spec uh, industrial deals in northern New Jersey uh, in the past few years that, that have leased very well. But you know, with the aging baby boomer, okay, which I'm the only one sitting here, David's the next thing. I'm one. actually a baby boomer, technically. Okay, so <laughs> with the aging baby boomer and people wanting to remain in the city as opposed to move down to the, you know, to the Sun Belt or other areas, one area is the, um, the luxury or the senior housing. Uh, how, how's your appetite and thoughts about senior housing, both rental senior housing and for sale senior housing? Chris? I, we don't really have a point of view. We don't, we don't, we don't play in the senior housing space, um, so I don't have a point of view on it. We've done some 55 and over uh, out in the suburbs, um, uh, and it's, it's done quite well. It's, some of it's uh, under development now, but uh, not, a, not a huge focus for us. But to, to David's point earlier about uh, infrastructure and so, so many of the, speci specifically out on Long Island, uh, so many of the, the school districts are, are over, overtaxed and, and you know, the, the permitting is for, uh, for 55 and over, which has been, which has been a good business. Dave? Um, we've done, you know, some of that. Um, we've actually done some um, here in the city that wasn't necessarily designated 55, but just the way that they, they oriented the project, it really was geared towards that. That's a little bit more favorable because of the, the real estate tax situation um, here in the city, although, you know, obviously the cost of living is a little bit higher. So we like that space. You know, the demographics certainly uh, play into that and are very favorable for it. I think you'll see a lot more of that in the future. What's your what's your interest in the office market in, in general, in the you know in, in the financing of uh, office buildings, especially in light of uh, co-working, co-sharing, you know, where a large number of these tenants are not, you know, they don't have the true financial backing and wherewithal. Have you gone into any properties where the WeWorks and the industrious are have been tenants? We like the office market generally, uh, especially in New York. It's been pretty flat and probably remains that way over through, through, through 19. Um, the co-working tenancy, there's a, a few of them out there. Um, it's, those are tougher to, tougher to stomach, those tenants, depending on how much of the space they're in, right? I mean, some portion of a building um, is okay, but too much of it uh, is, is a challenge. Dave, Matt? With, 
it's once again, you know, it's, it's sponsor centric, it's client centric. If we're partnered with a, uh, with a good client who's uh, somebody that we know and we like and, and we've worked with, um, I'd say we're, you know, more often bullish than not. Um, if it's a new borrower, we're going to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more cautious. You know, in those space we are, we do look at co-working deals, um, not only from from the WeWorks of the world, but there are a whole host of others. There's a home, right? You know, a whole group. I was of them including now. the entire. With all, club. and by the way, they all have different sort, different twists on the uh, on the theme. So where do where do you see 2019? You know, is my apple shiny? Um, you know, we're bullish. Um, our customers are active. Um, we're, we're certainly choosing our spots carefully. Uh, we're a little bit more cautious when it comes to sensitizing interest rates, um, maybe slowing down lease up and, and, and softening leasing assumptions a little bit when it comes to, to office in particular. Um, you know, uh, we've seen uh, a, a softening in rents for sure. Uh, but, but we're bullish and, and there's a lot of capital out there. Dave? We're in business. Um, I would say we're marginally bullish, um, a little bit cautious. We feel like we're uh, at the tail end or at the beginning slight of, a, of a potential credit cycle here, so we're, we're being cautious. And Chris? Yeah, from an economic perspective, we're cautious looking forward. Um, I think that that said, 2019 uh, looks a lot like 2018 in terms of you know, liquidity, capital that's chasing uh, commercial real estate. Great, I'd like to thank Matt, Dave, and Chris, and I'll see you next week.